Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the May Zoom Setters Workshop. Thank you for joining us. First, I would like to thank Alison Walton from the Immokalee IFS Center for her help and cooperation. Today's program offers one CEU for pesticide license renewal and one CEU for certified crop advisors. If you need CEUs, email me your name, email address, and license number. Today's program will focus on exploring citrus management practices to impact soil health. Our guest speaker is Dr. Sarah Strauss. She is an assistant professor in soil microbiology at the UF IFES Southwest Florida Research and Education Center in Immokalee. Her presentation will discuss the concept of soil health, including how soil microbes play a role in it and how we might measure it. Her presentation will also discuss management practices, including cover crops and compost that can be used to potentially improve soil health and will examine questions we still have about long-term impacts and optimization of these practices. Cover crops and compost can improve water and nutrient retention, promote microbial activity, reduce weed growth and insect pests, and improve the plant growth. A citrus greening can significantly impact root growth and nutrient and water uptake. The benefits from cover crops and compost may be an additional strategy to improve citrus production and reduce fertilizer and water inputs. Dr. Strauss, it's all yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, Manji. Um, thank you for um, organizing this and then for inviting me to speak. Um, and also, again, thanks to Allison for helping run the technical part of this. Um, so as Manji said, um, I am an assistant professor of soil microbiology. What I really focus on in my research is trying to understand um, the interactions between soil microbes and other soil microbes and soil microbes and crops, and in particular for the, our case here today, focusing on citrus. Um, and so, as Manji mentioned, I want to go over a couple things um, in the in this this morning. Um, uh, so there there are a few different topics, but they all link together in this general idea of soil health. So I first want to go over a little bit about what soil health means, um, why we are even thinking about soil microbes. Um, and then share some data from a couple of projects that, that uh, myself and some collaborators have been working on to look at some of these management practices that Manji mentioned, um, cover crops and compost. So let's see here. Let's get this mouse working here. There we go. All right. So first off, um, what is soil health? Um, and so there are a number of different definitions about soil health. Uh, the one that I like to use the most is from the USDA Natural Resource, Resource Conservation Service or NRCS, which defines soil health as the continued capacity of a soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. So, Soil health has sort of been the latest buzzword, I would say, or phrase, it's not one word, um, in the last couple of years. Um, and you probably have heard of the idea of soil quality and soil fertility, and we've been discussing these in agriculture for, for decades. Um, and so to a certain extent, soil health kind of just feels like the, the new kid on the block, the new way of, of, of spinning this idea of that we need to be interested and focused on soil quality and soil fertility. But the main difference is that soil health is actually um, for, in, in, different from the idea of soil quality and soil fertility and that it focuses a little bit more on 
soil biota, so soil biology, including microbes, in ways that really weren't included in the discussion of soil quality and soil fertility in the past. Um, those parameters and, and, and phrases were more focused on some of the physical and chemical parameters of soil, whereas soil health includes this biology component. But I think it's really important to keep in mind that soil health is an analogy. Um, and so when we're using this phrase of health, um, certainly for me, um, when I'm thinking about health, I'm thinking about this analogy to human health. And so just like, um, and so if we're thinking about how do we look at the factors that impact human health, we can look at things like diet, um, how much you exercise and things like genetics. But there are some of these things like diet and exercise that you have control over, at least in theory, um, to potentially change in a way to impact your human health. Um, however, things like genetics, not so much. Um, that's something they're kind of stuck with. And so keep that in mind when we're thinking about, okay, well, how do we measure health, right? And so if you go to your doctor and your doctor wants to see how healthy you are, they're going to make a bunch of measurements. Um, and based on these measurements, they're going to say, yeah, not so good here, buddy. Um, you need to, to do these things to improve your, your health. In a similar way, we can think of this, if we're using this analogy of health and between humans and, and soils, there are a slew of things that maybe you could measure in your soils to say, based on the numbers that you're seeing in some of these measurements, is your soil healthy? Um, that sort of kind of works, but this is where we have to keep this, keep it in mind that this is an analogy and that health is really context dependent. And so just as there might be a list of, of parameters that you go to your doctor and they say, yeah, you're not, you're, you're not healthy. You need to change these things. There's not a single set of hum numbers for one healthy human, right? What, me, what, what parameters and numbers you need to have to be a healthy 65-year-old are not the same as they are when you're two, right? And so there are some parameters that you're going to want to have in, in certain ways for a healthy soil in one location that you might not for another. Um, and so, again, there's not a single set of numbers that you want to see for a healthy soil across Florida or across the country or across the world. The soils in the Midwest for growing corn are going to be very different than the soils that we have here in Florida where we're growing tomatoes. It doesn't necessarily mean that the measurements that you make for a soil in Florida are automatically unhealthy. They might be, they're going to be very different than the numbers that you might measure in the Midwest, but these are kind of you can't really compare these things. Again, just like you can't compare a 65-year-old's health to a two-year-old's. Um, and so this is where we really have to keep this idea in mind that this is an analogy and it is really context dependent. Um, so the other thing to keep in mind though is in this list of measurements of things that you could look at for trying to assess the health of your soil. Um, where's my mouse? Sorry, computer, to, there you go. Uh, microbes are really critical to all of these indicators. And so when we're measuring um, things like soil pH, microbes are playing a role in soil pH. When we're measuring things like how much nitrogen is in the soil, that's those numbers exist because of microbes. And so this is another thing that we want to keep in mind when we're thinking about this term of soil health is are we measuring, what are we measuring and what is causing those measurements to change? Um, and in the end, microbes are usually the reason why things might be changing. So when we're thinking about soils and the soil microbiome, i.e. all the microbes in a soil, it's important, I think, to keep in mind that soils are incredibly complex. Um, and so you probably heard me share this statistic with you before, but I, it, think it's always good to remind ourselves, and it certainly makes me feel very small and tiny, when you think that in one gram of soil, basically the size of a quarter, you could have over a billion microbes. And that includes bacteria, fungi, archaea, all sorts of microorganisms. And in that same quarter size bit of soil, you could have 50,000 different 
types of bacteria. Species is a bit of a loaded word in soil microbiology, but for our um, discussion today, we're going to go with it. So in that very, very, very small, little tiny bit of soil, you have a huge number of microorganisms and potentially a huge diversity of microorganisms. And so that's, again, important, I think, to keep in mind that we are working with a really complex system. So how do we look at that, that system? How do we try and figure out what are all these microbes doing? The other thing that I think it's important to keep in mind, and this is something that's really changed the field of soil microbiology in the last 20 or 30 years, is that we now have learned that only 1% of all soil microbes can be cultured or grown on a Petri dish like this. And so that means that previously we, we were just, just barely touching the surface of our understanding of soil microbes and their importance. And so now that we've realized that we were only looking at 1%, um, we have much, we have more tools that are available to us now that weren't available even 15 years ago to really start to, to look at this, these groups of organisms much more closely. And so this includes things like culturing, like growing things on, on Petri dishes. We still do that to look at some specific microorganisms, but more frequently and particularly in my research program, we're using what we call culture independent methods. And so these methods are really focused on looking at the DNA or the RNA of these soil microorganisms and using that to try and identify who those organisms are. And so this is really letting us look much more in depth and in much more detail at that other 99% of the soil microbial community that we really just didn't have the tools to do, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And so this information um, lets us look at a bunch of things when we're thinking about the soil microbes. And so it lets us identify who's there, what types of organisms are there. It lets us figure out what are they doing, or at least make attempts to figure out what they're doing. And what the, we're also really trying to do is figure out how are they connected? How are they connected to each other? And how are they connected to the plant? So that's sort of how we're looking at these things. But again, the big question is why are soil microbes important? Why do we care about these organisms? Um, and so for a couple of reasons. And so one of the big things is that when we're focused on soil microbes and plant health, um, we're often really focused on this area called the rhizosphere. Um, let me get my laser here. Can you see that pointer? I think so. Um, and so the rhizosphere is this area right around the roots. Um, it's not a specific defined zone. It's the area of influence near the root. Um, so it's kind of a fuzzy, fuzzy term, but it's that those soil particles that are really in close contact with the roots. And this is an area where there's a lot of interaction between soil microbes and plants. Um, and in particular, um, because there can be direct interactions with plants and these microbes, plants might release compounds that will attract some of these microbes. And those microbes might help the plant acquire nutrients. Um, they might release compounds that signal um, and, include, and induce the plant to grow more roots. Um, they can also have some interactions between the plant and microbes for plant defense against pathogens. And so the plant might release certain compounds from its roots that attract certain bacteria or certain microbes that in turn release compounds to fight a particular pathogen or help the plant find a pathogen. And soil microbes can also help um, with aggregation, and so um, um, soil aggregation, which is important for keeping nutrients and water in close proximity to those roots. So there can be some really, really close associations between plants and these soil microbes in the rhizosphere that are really important for how the plant grows. The other big thing um, is that microbes are integral to uh, and intertwined, I guess would be a better word, with soil organic matter. And so this is a really complex looking diagram, but I think it also is nice because again, it illustrates how complex soils are. And so if we're looking at this, um, you can see here, this, this zone over here is the rhizosphere and you're moving away from the root as you get further away into the bulk soil. And so this brown right here is a living plant root and you can see all of these different little things here are different microbes. We've got the, some bacteria here. We've got virus particles. 
this yellow thing is a fungal hyphae. You've got some dead plant roots. And all of these are helping pull together, excuse me, what we think of as soil organic matter. And that plants are, are releasing compounds that are attracting these bacteria. They're in turn chewing up some of these other materials and helping bring some of these soil microbes and, and change this material into soil organic matter. A slightly more simplified way of looking at this is to think that organic matter is really um, is what happens when you have plant material that falls to the soil surface. And that serves as basically food for these soil microbes. And so once those soil microbes um, start eating this material, that's increasing, that's providing more food for them. So they're gonna have increased activity. It might attract more different types of organisms. So you can have increased diversity and increasing diversity might mean more decomposition, more breakdown of that organic matter. That's also going to then release different nutrients um, and release different compounds from that or from that plant material that helps form this organic matter. And that in turn can lead to these, these characteristics that might help improve your plant health. So microbes and soil organic matter are really, really closely linked and that they need um, organic matter to provide resources for their growth. And in turn, they also help contribute to the building of organic matter. And so organic matter comes into play a lot when we're thinking about soil health in Florida. Um, as you're probably very familiar with, our soils, um, our agricultural soils, unless you're over in the EAA, have incredibly low organic matter, often 1% or less. We are trying to grow things on beach sand. And so one of the key things that we uh, I've been looking at in my research group for methods to improve soil health have to do with ways that we can possibly try and increase that soil organic matter. Can we try and add carbon to the soil? Can we add resources to the soil to help the microbes that already exist and to help those microbes grow and change and those microbial communities grow and change in ways that can improve plant growth? So there are a couple of ways you can do this. So cover crops are certainly one method. Uh, compost is another. Um, and then you can also possibly add some humic and fulvic acids. And so I'm going to focus today um, in this talk on cover crops and compost. I do have some trials with Dr. Uta Albrecht looking at humics um, in citrus, but I'm not going to show any of that data today. So first up, cover crops. So cover crops um, are crops planted to benefit the soil. Um, by definition, cover crops are a practice for improving soil health because you're not harvesting them for profit, you are only planting them in an effort to change your soil health. Um, and they are not a new concept. Um, this picture, of which is not of the greatest quality, but it's a picture from a scan of a picture from 1929. Um, where there is a guy here in the middle with a big, big measuring stick, um, and he's in a citrus orchard. I think this was actually in California, but he's in a citrus orchard, and in the middle, um, he's in a big field. Of, in the row middle, there are cover crops, and so again, this is not a new, new concept, but it's not been super common in citrus in Florida um, for a while. Um, it is increasingly common practice for growers of grains, cotton corn, soybeans, uh, also used for some vegetable production, where they're, in those systems, the cover crops are grown during the fallow season, um, and they're often combined with other conservation or no-till management practices to try and improve soil health. But of course, uh, when we're doing cover crops and citrus, we have to change things up a little bit. And so we've had a number of field trials um, looking at cover crops and, and trying to figure out how to, to grow cover crops and citrus, but also how to quantify some of these impacts of cover crops and citrus. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit um, this morning about some trials that we have here in Southwest Florida. Um, the trees are Valencia on Swingle, and we're, I'm going to show you some information from two different groves. These were, uh, this trial was started in two different groves in the Immokalee area, both managed in the same way. Um, tree ages uh, were the same. Also, uh, both of them are Valencia on Swingle. Um, but we are, I'm going to share some of those results here. And in, when we're doing our cover crop research, 
we're planting our cover crops um, using annual species twice a year, um, the beginning of the rainy season and at the end of the rainy season. And this is one of the biggest, it seems obvious, but it's one of the biggest um, things that we found really factors into the success of your cover crops is making sure that you are able to get them in the ground while there's still regular rain. Um, and so for the experiments that we've been doing, we've looked at a variety of annual species of cover crops, and we have different mixes targeted for the summer and the winter. And so the summer ones we plant at the beginning of the rainy season, we're getting started um, in the next couple of weeks planting these. And at the end of the rainy season for the winter, we'll plant them at the end of October, early November, and let those grow um, through the, throughout the winter and spring. We've done our trials um, looking and comparing mixtures that have legumes and mixtures that don't have legumes. Um, and I'll show you some of those results here, but a, a wide variety of, of different species that we've been planting. Generally, before we plant our cover crops, um, we've experimented with either herbiciding the row middle um, or and then planting or um, doing a really shallow disc and then planting our cover crops. And all of our cover crops are planted using a no-till drill. So what have we found? Um, so like I said, we've been look we were looking at this uh, trial or this experiment in two different groves. Um, and the impacts on soil microbes in particular really depended on the grove. And the big differences in those groves were how well those cover crops grew. This again, seems kind of obvious, but it's confirmation that it's the cover crops that are re resulting in these changes. And so if we don't see big changes in our cover crops or great germination in our cover crops, we don't see big changes in our soil microbial community. And so these, these uh, graphs that I'm showing here, and there'll be a couple more um, throughout the talk, um, each point on the graph, shape, color, whatever, is the total bacteria or fungal community composition of one sample. And so the closer together these shapes are to each other, the more similar that community composition is to another sample. Um, and so what we see here is that these uh, triangles and diamonds are from the grove that um, didn't have great cover crop growth. And so you can see all of those shapes, um, all of those colors, which are our different cover crop treatments are all kind of grouping together. So we saw no difference in the bacterial community um, based on treatment at that particular grove. However, uh, also for the fungi, same deal. Um, we do see a bit of a change with time. So the triangles are the uh, the end of the experiment and the diamonds are the beginning of the experiment, but there is real no treatment impact. But on another grove, we saw a pretty big shift. Um, and so in this grove, we had really nice cover crop growth um, over, this is also over three years. Um, and we do see some big differences. And so here, this is, um, Let's see, what am I looking at here? This is the start of the experiment um, and the last time point in the control. So the last time point in the control are the blue circles and all the squares are from the beginning of the trial before we started planting cover crops. And so before you started planting, everything was kind of the same. And at the end, the control was still the same more or less as the beginning, a little bit different. But what was really exciting was that we saw total differences in the bacterial community in the soils that had our cover crop mixtures. And so the reds are mixtures that had legumes and non-legumes, and the greens are mixtures that had only non-legumes. We saw a similar pattern when we look at the fungi. Again, big shift in totally different fungal community in soils that had these cover crop mixes. And again, differences based on the type of mixture that we are planting. So if you have great cover crop germination, we saw some pretty big differences in those um, bacterial and fungal communities. And not only are we seeing differences in the just overall community composition, we're seeing differences in what those functions are in the soil microbial community, what those organisms are capable of doing. So these first graphs here are just showing total bacteria and total archaea. Um, and so we've got the um, legume plus non-legume treatment, 
the non-legume treatment in the middle and the grower standard control on the end here. And the blue is before the trial started and the red is after three years. And so in everything we saw increases in total bacteria and total archaea, but we saw bigger increases under those cover crops. But if we also look at just the um, genes used by bacteria and archaea for ammonia oxidation, we saw a big shift. And so this is indicating that these cover crops are changing the functions of some of these organisms in the soil and that we see more of these organisms that are capable of oxidizing ammonia and so changing ammonia to nitrate in soils that had these legume plus non-legume cover crops. And so we see that for bacteria and archaea. So again, these cover crops are changing the functions of these microbes. And so we saw also big differences in denitrifying microbes. And so organisms that are able to go from NO2 to NO. Um, and what's really exciting for us here too, is that not only are we seeing differences, um, we're not only seeing that there's increases in the number of these organisms, but we're seeing differences in who those organisms are based on the cover crops. And so in both for two different phases of denitrification, we see complete shifts in the organisms that are, are carrying out those functions based on cover crops. So here, the blue in both of these graphs is the grower standard control. The um, orange is the non-legume and the green is the treatment with legumes and non-legumes. And so you can see for these different types of denitrification, we have completely different organisms that are performing those functions based on what types of cover crops were growing in the soil. So that's a huge shift in those, those types of microorganisms based on those cover crops. And so we see changes in other predicted bacteria functions too when we plant cover crops. These are a slew of, of um, functions that the microbes can carry out in the soils. Um, and what's interesting here is we see really big increases in the potential functions assigned to things like carbon metabolism and nitrogen metabolism when you plant cover crops. And so these dark bars here, the green and the, the orange are from soils after three years of both cover crop mixtures. And so they're much higher than the blue bars, which are our grower standard control. And so we're again, seeing these changes in the functions that are able to be performed by these microorganisms when you plant cover crops. So there, is, there are shifts going on in these microbial communities. So of course, the big question is, well, does it help? How does this impact the tree? We are planting these cover crops in the row middles, right? Where is the tree? The tree's on the side. Um, we are not planting cover crops trunk to trunk for any of our experiments for a variety of reasons. Um, but we're, and so the question is, well, does this impact the tree? And so we did a little experiment recently. This is done by a graduate student in my lab, Emma Dawson, where um, we took soil from these cover crop treatments. Um, and we took soil from the grower standard control and we planted um, citrus seedlings into these soils. And because it's very hard to measure root citrus roots in the row middles in the field, we said, well, let's, let's try and, and take a step into the greenhouse to, to mess with this. And so this is looking at what is the community composition of the roots or the soil around the roots of these citrus seedlings that were grown either in control soil or cover crop soil. And so the orange colors are samples that were um, from soils in the cover crops and the green are from soils that were in the control. And we've got a one month in the circles and a four months in the triangles. And so you can see that the cover, the soils, uh, the, the soil from around the citrus seedlings that were grown in cover crops have different bacterial communities than those that are grown in the control. So even though we're planting the cover crops away from the tree, those citrus roots, A, are going into the row middles. Um, you're, you're, the citrus roots definitely are growing into those row middles and those changes in the soils that are occurring because of the uh, cover crops are impacting what microbes are found around those citrus roots. Now, the next big thing, of course, would be, does this change anything about yield and fruit quality? And unfortunately, we have not seen any big changes in 
yield or fruit quality in these trials. However, these were conducted in a grove that had trees that were about 35 years old. And um, just like it's hard to change 35 year old people, it's hard to quickly change 35 year old trees. And so um, we're, we think that might be one of the reasons we haven't seen major things yet. And so we do have some trials now that have been started on younger trees, um, looking at eight and 10 year old trees. And we're gonna be starting a trial very soon on I believe um, brand new trees. And so again, it'll take a little while to see yield data for those, um, but we're, excuse me, curious to see if that has any uh, different impacts. The other thing is that even in, grow crops um, that are using cover crops as a treatment. It's pretty uh, standard to not see any production changes, even for those um, systems with cover crops for at least three to five years um, until the, after the management practice has, has been carried out and has been started. Um, so this is a long-term change that we might see, but we're encouraged by the fact that we're already seeing some pretty big changes in the soil microbial community and the functions that are being carried out by those soil microbes when we go when we grow cover crops. So take home, cover crops can change the soil microbiome composition and their functions. The magnitude of those changes does depend on the cover crop mix and uh, the germination and so how well you have your cover crops germinating. Um, and the cover crops can still impact the citrus rhizosphere, even if you're only planting your cover crops in the row middles. We still, of course, have lots and lots of questions. Like I said, looking at the long-term impacts on the tree, looking at some more details about nutrient release and availability, and looking at some things about carbon sequestration, which I'll talk a little bit more about later today. So that's cover crops. Um, so the other big thing that you could potentially do for improving your soil health is to look at compost. And so you're probably aware of some of these benefits and challenges with compost uh, and citrus. One of the, the big benefits, more or less, is its availability. Um, there certainly can be lots of compost available. Um, it's relatively straightforward to apply if you've got um, a spreader. Um, and it can be serve as an additional nutrient source, which is which is always welcome, I think. But it also has a number of difficulties. Um, it can be expensive. Um, it can related to that can be the application frequency. How often do you need to apply? That's obviously going to add into your expense. And that's going to also add into the availability, depending on how much you need. Maybe the availability is not so great. Um, it can be difficult um, to also make sure that your compost is of similar quality and, and um, uh, a, a com a composition from year to year. And so ideally you're wanting to apply a similar material each year and not have it be super variable. And um, as my colleague, Dr. Ramdas Kalanisari has, has demonstrated um, and done some work with, it can be a potential source of weed seeds. And so you really wanna make sure that you're paying attention or, or aware of how that compost has been treated before you're spreading it in your grove. But of course, then the big question is, well, does it actually do anything for the tree? And so um, my colleague, Dr. Uta Albrecht and I have been uh, conducting a field trial with uh, at a commercial citrus grove um, where we've been applying compost um, twice a year. And this trial was very interesting because we also have four different rootstocks, X639, US802, US812, and US897. And so we were applying a plant-based compost or had a non-compost -com treatment where, again, we were applying it twice a year at, I believe, um, not sure if that number is right. Oh, it's 12 tons per hectare, not acre. That's what it is. Um, and so we wanted to look at, again, since I'm the microbiologist, one of the first things I wanted to look at is what is this doing to the soil microbial community? Um, because when you're applying this, it doesn't look like a whole lot. Um, what was really interesting is that for this study, we were looking at the active um, bacterial community with associated with the rhizosphere of the citrus trees. So this is the active microorganisms, active bacteria um, in the soil surrounding those roots. And we saw something I definitely did not expect to see, that we have really specific interactions with compost based on the rootstock. 
And so what you can see here is that we really, so these are all um, the squares here are all the control soils. And so the colors are the different rootstocks. 802 is in blue, 812 is in red, uh, 897 in green, and X639 in purple. And you can see all the colors in the control are more or less together. So the community composition of these different rootstocks, if you don't add compost, are more or less the same. There are some differences in diversity, but the community composition is basically the same. But once you apply compost, we saw some big changes in that bacterial community composition. And so in particular, you see the greens over here for 897 and the reds for 812 had really different community compositions when we added that compost. Um, now, this is also interesting because 812 and 897 are supposed to potentially have higher quality fruit. Um, but the impact and the relationship on that remains to be seen because these trees, um, I think, are just hit three years last this past spring. And so we don't have a whole lot of harvest data on these trees yet. But it's really interesting that we're seeing that really specific change in the bacterial community composition with compost, but only for specific rootstocks. And so Dr. Albrecht and I were really interested also, of course, in is how these changes in the bacteria around the roots might be related to some of the root nutrients. And so interestingly, we saw some correlations between bacterial diversity and composition with some of these nutrients. For example, uh, magnesium, which is important for root growth and fruit quality, um, was positively correlated with differences in bacterial diversity for all of the rootstocks. The rootstocks here are on the bottom. But things like zinc and uh, manganese really were only different for 812 and 897. Um, again, these are nutrients that are, can be really important for plant defense and photosynthesis. Again, we're also still not sure if this translates into increases in plant growth and yield, but it's really interesting that, we're, again, we're seeing these really specific interactions between compost and these root nutrients for specific rootstocks. We we're also able to correlate some of these changes in root nutrients with very specific bacterial groups. Um, so, for example, um, bacteria that are in the acetobacteria group were really positively correlated with iron. Um, iron, these organisms are known to produce uh, siderophores and they colonize the rhizosphere and can really lead to increases in iron concentration. And so we see also increases in root iron concentration. And so there was this really interesting, again, interactions between some of these specific bacteria, specific rootstocks and compost. So what we've learned so far from this study is that the compost impacts on the rhizosphere do, do differ based on your rootstock. Um, and the compost can change the rhizosphere microbes related to some of these specific root nutrients. Uh, again, there's still some questions. As I said, these are, are really young trees. And so we're still um, looking to see what kind of impact these have on the trees overall. Um, more questions about nutrient release and availability. And what we'd really like to look at in the future um, is some more information on different compost rates, um, different compost types, and do, you st do we still see some of these same interactions? So cover crops, compost, humix, these are all things that you can potentially try and do and management techniques you could use to try and improve your soil health. Um, but how do you know you're on the right track? Uh, like I mentioned with cover crops, some of these are what I would consider long-term investment practices. You're not necessarily going to see changes in your trees for a couple of years. Um, like I said, that's that's normal even for row crops. Um, so how do you know if things are changing? And so I've, I've shown that we see a lot of changes in the soil microbial community, but that's not necessarily the easiest thing to measure for everybody, right? So how do we know if these practices are working, aside from waiting three to five years to see if we see any changes in our tree? And so this is where this idea of soil health indicators comes into play. Um, and so at the beginning of the talk, I mentioned a list of things that you might measure to try and see if your soil is healthy. And these are what we call soil health indicators. There is a huge list of these. Um, and so the USDA NRCS has a large list of potential things that you could measure, soil health indicators that they've categorized in certain ways. But there are 30 different one, 31 different methods listed. 
um, by NRCS. You may have heard of the Soil Health Institute. This is an organization that is, as the name implies, focused on soil health. And, and one of the things that they're working on is also trying to look at and determine um, what indicators you should be looking at for measuring the health of your soil. And they've categorized them in different ways. Um, there are now commercial um, labs that have soil health tests. Um, well, Cornell is the, the Cornell University has a soil health lab that you can send soil to. I know Waters and Ward also now have a soil health test that's available as well. Um, but there are, you know, how do you know which one to choose, right? There are a huge number of things here. Um, and the other thing that I think it's important to keep in mind is a lot of these are looking at um, sort of proxy measurements for microbes. So at the beginning, I mentioned that microbes are important for all of these components of a healthy soil. And there are some indicators that at least by their name, seem to say that they're looking at, at microbial activity or microbial diversity. But there are a couple of caveats that you have to keep in mind when we're thinking about the results of the, some of those studies or some of those indicators. So for example, microbial biomass, the general assumption is that more microbial biomass equals a healthier soil. But there are a couple of things you have to keep in mind. There are actually quite a few ways to measure microbial biomass and they're not all well calibrated and they're not all, um, uh, you can't necessarily um, compare all of these directly. Um, and so you wanna be paying attention that if you had microbial biomass measured one way in your soil and somebody else has it, had it measured a different way in another soil, those numbers cannot be compared very easily. The other thing to keep in mind is the biomass includes all microorganisms, both the beneficial ones and the pathogenic ones. And so maybe you have a huge microbial biomass of pathogens. You probably already know that by looking at your tree, but it's something to keep in mind when you're looking at results of, of these types of measurements. Um, similar thing with, with measuring uh, microbial enzyme activities and ratios, there are lots of different methods. Um, there are some, some of these methods and differences on whether you've got a dry soil or a soil fresh from the field, things like that, that might give you different results. And so again, that's something you want to keep in mind. And one of my favorite methods that's actually recommended by NRCS um, is something under the category of sampling for life. And basically what they define this method is, is collect a bunch of soil, stick it in a freezer, and someday somebody will know what to do with it, which I guess is great job security for me, but it amuses me that this is part of a government publication. Um, so there are, like I said, lots of different ways in, to potentially measure soil health. And so most of those indices and uh, indicators have also not necessarily been studied in Florida. And as we've established and talked, um, Florida soils are very different than soils in other parts of the country. And so um, myself and some collaborators have some funding right now from the USDA NIFA to try and tackle this issue in Florida citrus. And so we are measuring um, short and long-term indicators um, in commercial citrus groves where we've um, using cover crops as a, as a way to give us a range or a potential range of soil health. And so one grove, um, we've had cover crops for, uh, geez, nearly five years now. And then the other grove, we've had cover crops for about two years now. And so you name it, we are measuring it. Um, so these are all the short-term indicators, which we measure at one soil depth three times a year. These are all the long-term indicators that we measure once a year at three different soil depths down to 50 centimeters. We're also looking at cover crop data and tree yield and tree data. And we're sending some soil to some of these commercial soil health tests so that we can compare their results with ours. So we're just starting to, to look at this data and I have to give a big shout out to a uh, graduate student, Yaz Gonzalez, who is working with my colleague, Dr. Um, Gabriel Maltes Landry in Gainesville on some of these. And so this is data from her fresh off, off the uh, analysis board where we're looking at the percent change in some of the long-term indicators um, in the 
treatments with cover crops compared to the no treatment control. So if it's above zero, there is a positive change compared to the control. If it's below zero, there was a negative change compared to the control. Hopefully I got that right. Um, and so the blue is the grower standard control. The green is the legume plus non-legume cover crop mix. And the orange is the non-legume mix. And so we've got old grove, which is in the lighter shade. These are the this is the grove where we've had cover crops for a number of years, and the young grove is, is the more recent one. And you can see that we do have um, some positive changes in the C to N ratio, so the carbon to nitrogen ratio in the soils um, with these cover crop treatments. Um, and we have some different changes in some of the total nitrogen. And so some of this is stuff that we're still trying to analyze and understand, but we are seeing some pretty significant differences um, with these treatments, even in the young grove in just a few short years. We're also seeing some differences in some of these short-term indicators. Um, again, some of the big ones um, are, this is LOI is one measure of soil organic matter. And, oh, I didn't highlight it, hold on. Um, and the other one that we're looking at is POC-C, which is another measure of soil organic matter where we see some really interesting differences, again, between the old grove and the young grove. Um, some of these other measurements, we're also still just trying to uh, understand what we're seeing here as well. But in particular, I'm really interested in some of these patterns that we might be seeing in soil carbon, because soil carbon is related to this idea of soil organic matter and carbon sequestration. And so trying to get a good handle and a good way to quantify that is really important for trying to assess the soil health and the efficacy of some of these practices. And so here we've got, um, just for the old grove, looking at these different methods, the LOI is loss on ignition, epoxy is um, a way of... It, looking at possibly a more reactive um, form of carbon that might change more quickly. And so one of the interesting things that we saw here too is that we're seeing some big changes. We're seeing changes. You can see, so this, all of the colors here are the times um, that we collected samples. And you can see as we go um, to the red, which is the most recent sample just in February, there's a general positive increase. And so we're seeing some of these increases in carbon related in this case, particularly to moisture, um, which is not too surprising. But when we're taking moisture into account, we're seeing some of these positive changes and in both methods, which is not necessarily what we expected. Um, I think sometimes we were thinking that um, soil organic matter with the LOI method might require a longer time period before we see big changes. But like I said, this is a project that is in progress. Um, we, are, we are actively working on analyzing some of this data. And so what we're ultimately hoping to do is determine which indicators are best at different time scales. Um, what indicators should you measure once a year? Are there some that you might want to measure multiple times a year? to monitor whether any of your management practices are changing your soil health. And of course, we're also hoping to get some more data on how cover crops are impacting soil health and groves with different tree ages. So quick summary, um, I think it's really important to remember that soil health is an analogy to help us think about ecosystem functions. Um, and that just like there is not one way or one ideal health um, set of parameters for a human. There is not one ideal set of, of parameters for a healthy soil, and it's really context dependent. Microbes are super important um, for soil health, and they're super important for soils, um, particularly because of their contributions to soil organic matter, nutrient cycling, and plant defenses. Cover crops and compost can impact soil microbes and citrus groves. Um, but it might be rootstock and tree age dependent. And so some of these, these interactions um, can potentially help with nutrient acquisition and, and, and root growth. And those are things that we're still looking at. Um, but these practices can alter that soil microbiome and alter it in a way that is changing the organisms that are living around those citrus roots. And um, a lot of the soil health indicators that are available for measuring soil health have really not been evaluated in, in our Florida subtropical climate. And so um, we're hoping to get some more information and, and provide a more targeted list of soil health indicators and things that you should be looking at 
to try and make sure that you're on the right track if you are trying some of these management practices. And so with that, I'd like to thank um, all of my fantastic collaborators, in particular, um, former postdoc Antonio Castellana Hinoso, who's back in Spain. Um, all of our grower collaborators, our funding sources, USDA, NIFA, and CRDF, and of course, my amazing, awesome lab team who goes out in the middle of the summer to collect all these samples and, and does it with a smile. So I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Strauss. We have time for questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. Anybody has a question or comment? Looks not. Thank you, Allison. You are most welcome. Thank you, Dr. Strauss. That was awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you all for your participation. Again, if you need CEUs, please send me an email and include your name, your email address, and your license number. I just got a, there's a question is about, is there a company that plants the cover crops? Um, I do not know of one. We've done it all ourselves for all of all our trials. Um, we, I can certainly, I'm happy to share um, some, a number of companies where you can buy the cover crop seed. Um, I don't know right now of a company that does this, but that would be, Fantastic information if somebody does know of one. Any other questions? I'm happy to stay on for a few minutes if there are more questions. Dr. Strauss, can you tell us a little bit more about the compost that you all utilized? Um, maybe what it was made of and where you got it from? Sure, um, I, we it's a plant-based compost. Um, I don't have the exact company name off the top of my head. It's it's um, from the, the general, I think it's from Naples, somewhere in the area. Um, there are a number of, of compost companies out there right now. Um, and so, but most of the stuff that I've been looking at has been plant-based. So yard waste, basically why plant-based versus something that might contain more nitrogen or organic matter from a biosolids compost? Good question. Um, for the most part, this has been due to ease of availability. Um, and um, it's sound from sort of our informal discussion with some growers, um, they were more interested in doing some of the plant-based compost. But I am hoping to start a study soon um, looking at some of these different types of compost and, and seeing some of those differences um, with, or if there are differences um, with, with some of those uh, questions. But yeah, that is, that is a good question. Any other question? Okay, thank you all for your participation and see you next time. Thank you guys. Thank you all.